もし何を何も聞こえますかえっと、静かと私の音の問題、どちらでしょうか Yes. I have forgotten. <laughs> Now, have I shared my screen? Oh, I clicked shared screen, so let's try again. Yes, I'm clicking share. Oh, do I have to do something else? Now, is it sharing? Okay, so this is my first short talk, and this is about the IAU Working Group for Professional Amateur Relations in Astronomy, or for short, the PROAM Working Group. And this working group was formed just two years ago. So the fact is that for 
over 100 years, the IAU has mainly ignored amateur astronomers. And it's been just a closed society for professional astronomers. And so when the IAU was formed, I think there were about 100 members at first. And they were older men with gray hair talking about um, standard stars and uh, how to do spectral classification and stellar photometry. Those were important topics. And amateurs were completely ignored. However, in 2019, I sent um, uh, a memo to the IAU Executive Committee and proposing that we should um, have a pro-am working group. This also proposed um, that amateur societies should have some kind of method of affiliation with the IAU and um, there should be a symposium on pro-am relations. In this memo, which I sent to Evin van Dishoek, who was then president of the IAU, I identified three different types of amateur astronomer. And the first, which I called group one of amateur astronomers, were those able to do significant research in astronomy and uh, contribute to research that professionals are doing. Group two of amateurs were those with small telescopes who enjoy looking at the night sky, but perhaps don't aspire to do useful research. In other words, new knowledge is not their um, intention. Then a very large group three of amateurs are those who read about astronomical discoveries. Perhaps they subscribe to an astronomy magazine like Sky and Telescope uh, or the Japanese equivalent, and I don't know what it's called, but I'm sure there is one. So people who read um, about astronomy are a very large group of amateurs. So how many amateur astronomers are there in the world? In fact, no one really knows, but I know that in some countries, amateur astronomer astronomy is very popular. I went to Iran a few years ago, and they have about 30,000 amateur astronomers. New Zealand has a lot for its small population. Thailand has a lot. And probably, I don't know, but Japan probably also has a lot. So I know there are many public observatories in, in Japan where people can view the stars. So um, in these countries, such as Iran, New Zealand, and others, about one person in 2,500 is an amateur astronomer. New Zealand has a population of 5 million, and I think there are about 2,000 amateur astronomers. A similar proportion in Iran, certainly. So how many are there worldwide? Um, I think there will be over 1 million amateurs in all those three groups combined. But group one, those able to do research, a very small number, perhaps only 2% of amateurs. I'm, I'm guessing these groups are not very well defined, I must admit. Group two, maybe 25%, those who have telescopes and like looking at the stars. And group three, a very large group who enjoy reading about astronomy. So if there are over 1 million amateurs, then the ratio of amateur astronomers to professionals worldwide is about 100 to 1. So every professional astronomer or IAU member will have, uh, there, will, there will be 100 amateurs in the world. So group one, if group one is say 2%, that's already twice as many amateurs doing research as IAU members, professional astronomers. So it's very, even group one, even though it is small, is still very important in terms of numbers. 
The IAU has had two strategic plans for 2010 to 20 and now 2020 to 30. I have to stop sharing. What do I have to do now? So Zoom settings. Where do I find them up here? Show taskbar. Security participants. Our um, settings. And then uh, microphone. Microphone. Okay, so microphone is responding to my voice. Perfect. And we set up the screen with the. Um, but go back to you exit the closer setting here and share screen. And I think we should share this one because then they will see it. And yeah. okay, so I'm now talking. Uh, how can we tell if people online can hear? Is that? So I'm going to go back just one slide. And here I estimate that there are over 1 million amateur astronomers in groups one, two, and three combined. Group one may be just 2% of the total, but even 2% of a million is 20,000 which is almost twice as many um, professional astronomers who are IAU members. Is it okay? I've got to speak louder, oh my goodness. So in the IAU strategic plan uh, for 2010 to 2020, um, they uh, resolved to engage with amateurs and the present strategic plan um, made a commitment to, uh, for that engagement with amateur astronomers and to, to connect professionals and amateur astronomers, to quote their words. So, um, in the memorandum that established the Office for Astronomy Outreach, it states that the organization of the network of national outreach coordinators, the NOCs, are responsible for maintaining the relationship with the national communities of amateur astronomers and science outreach professionals. So this is explicitly a mission of the IAU through OAO to engage with amateur astronomers. So at the executive committee meeting in April, 2021, uh, a working group for pro-am relations was established and that was strongly supported by IAU president, Avin Pandishuk and 
also by president-elect Deborah Elmagreen. And the first thing we did was establish an organizing committee for the new working group. And I think there were about, was it 11 members? And I think um, what is important for any organizing committee is it has a global distribution and gender parity. So if you uh, look, look at the countries our working group members come from, they are every inhabited continent on earth uh, is represented and is roughly 50-50 men and women. Two of these people uh, left uh, our working group in uh, December 2021. Uh, you, uh, they were um, Stella Kafka from AAVSO and um, Mirjana Povic, but Myra Lebron and Clementina Sasso uh, from Puerto Rico and Italy replaced them. So what was the mission of our ProAm working group? The first thing we did was we needed a database of amateur societies because to communicate with amateurs, the best way is through amateur societies. And we formed a database by doing a survey worldwide of amateur astronomy societies. And in this survey, we proposed research collaborations between active research amateurs and IOU professionals who wanted to work together. We also suggested that some workshops, possibly in person or virtual, for amateur and professional astronomers would be very useful. And we wanted to promote the OAO uh, program, Meet the IAU Astronomers, whereby IAU members give talks to amateur societies. We, <coughs> we suggested a, an IAU symposium, a full length symposium on pro am relations, would also be very useful. So Tim Spuck from the USA, by the way, Tim is now uh, co-chair with Aniket Suli. Uh, he took over from me as co-chair last August. And Tim Spuck conducted a survey of amateur astronomers. Nearly 2,000 amateurs around the world responded to the survey. 367 amateur associations or societies uh, responded to the survey and over 500 professional astronomers. And the responses were very enthusiastic for collaborating in research, very uh, positive um, for a workshop uh, over one or two days. And so this survey enabled the database of contacts to be established. So in group one, amateurs able to do research, um, we identified several different types of research, which we knew amateurs were very good at. This is not a complete list, but variable star photometry is clearly very popular for many uh, research active amateurs. Occultations of uh, stars by asteroids, uh, precise timing can give uh, asteroid dimensions, supernova searches, light curves of galactic nervi, well that's a kind of variable star photometry of course, microlensing photometry to discover exoplanets um, has become quite popular and several amateurs in New Zealand I know are doing this kind of work and probably many others worldwide. Astrometry of asteroids and minor planets is also something amateurs can do. So we want to establish a website uh, where um, IAU members who want amateur collaborators can propose their projects and amateurs can say they are interested. And I believe this website is not quite yet live, uh, but it's going to be on the IAU website. There was a meeting of 
the um, organizing committee just yesterday, which I didn't participate in, but um, I think this uh, getting this website live was probably discussed. We also want to have a workshop um, at the IAU Centenary Celebration in 2019 in Brussels, Belgium. After that uh, celebration, there was a one day workshop. So this is a precedent. This was an in-person workshop and probably about a hundred amateurs from uh, Belgium, Netherlands and neighboring countries came and discussed their research. Uh, and other activities. That was a very successful in-person meeting. So we want to continue this theme. And Aniket Suli in Mumbai, India, is organizing a workshop over, I think, two days or three days in November this year. So, Meet the IAU Astronomers uh, is an OAO program, but strongly supported by the working group. Um, so far, um, there were 38 requests in the previous year, but this was, of course, during the pandemic. And I think many more requests now that people can travel are likely, and the working group can support this program. A few years ago, I made a proposal for an IAU symposium in Iran to be in Shiraz, Iran, with uh, Iranian astronomer Mohan Mosley. And this was uh, declined by the executive committee. I think that's a great pity because this was a proposal to have a symposium on pro-am relations and given 30,000 amateur astronomers in Iran, I think surely at least a thousand would have come to Shiraz. It could have been the largest IAU symposium ever. But um, we should continue this idea, perhaps for a symposium in India or Japan, a country with many amateurs and it could be a very successful symposium. Well, we have a organizing committee of our working group with uh, 11 members, um, but we've also got a different type of working group membership called members at large. And these are people who are simply interested in our activities. And there are over three dozen, I think there are about 40 people have joined this group and anyone, IAU members and amateurs are welcome to join and we communicate via Basecamp, the uh, website Basecamp, um, with uh, IAU working group, uh, program working group activities uh, discussed. So that's all on the working group. Um, Susanna, do you have any comments or anyone else for that matter? Oh. Yes, yes, well, the, the oh, I'm getting a lot of feedback. Oh. So um, the proposal for an IAU symposium on pro-am relations was made, I think, in 2016, and it was declined for a symposium in 2017. We haven't done that again, but it I think we will, but I think it's more important to have a short workshop for one or two days and have those every two years before we make the next step of a five day symposium. So uh, it's really doing the easier thing first before we propose a full length symposium. So, not yet.
Um, uh, Zoom. And I can unmute my mic. Can everybody at Zoom hear me okay? I will do a quick presentation on my side here. Uh, I just wanna introduce a couple of ways amateur astronomer groups can um, interact with us. I think you are seeing my correct screen on Zoom. Yeah. So, sorry, idea was to use the same computer. So we are, there you go. Technical issues, everyone, sorry, forget me. Uh, it's the first live event I do at NEOJ. So I'm very excited. <laughs> so, um, for the ones that don't know, I think probably everybody who is in this meeting know this, the Office for Astronomy Outreach is a collaboration between the International Astronomical Union and the National Observatory of Japan. We live under the motto, Astronomy for Everyone. And we achieve this by providing access, engaging the public with astronomy communicating, and delivering a portfolio of global projects and initiatives through collaborations, including with amateur astronomers groups. So we have loads of things going on in the OIO, lots of projects, publication, programs, trainings, but today I will focus on four that I think are super, super great ways for amateur astronomers groups to engage with us. First, we have what um, John mentioned, the Mid-IU Astronomers. Uh, as John said, is a program that connect amateur astronomer group, but also formal educators, informal educators, um, community organizers with professional astronomers, members of the IU for events online and in person. So event organizers can contact professional astronomers to deliver these events, these meetups, where, where I'm astro astronomers get to talk not only about their research or different astronomical topics, but also about the impact of astronomy in society and possible career paths in astronomy. So uh, this is gonna be on YouTube. So that's why there is a QR code there with uh, a link to the program. I will also add in the description, uh, please uh, request more events. Another easy way to directly engage with the OAO is through our event maps. So um, it open for event organizers of, of ast astronomy outreach events, could be uh, also astro uh, amateur astronomer groups. It's a great way for them to promote their, their event uh, to connect with a broader community, but also to share the best practice while they're cooking that is different and like create a network and share this knowledge. Uh, in October, we have 100 Hours of Astronomy, which is an uh, uh, event that celebrates astronomy around through 100 hours around the globe celebration. So we invite practitioners for astronomy outreach practitioners, researchers, amateur astronomers group to organize an astronomy outreach event, share with us and create this big worldwide celebration. Um, we also, it's a way to celebrate and share with the broader, broader audience, our beautiful astronomical surroundings. And last but not least, we have coming up very soon in May, the Dark and Quiet Skies project, which aim to aid awareness of the importance to preserve dark and quiet skies. For the project, people can learn about the importance of dark skies for human culture, heritage, health, as well as the use of dark skies for astronomy research. This year, uh, we are cooking very cool things. Uh, we have our social media campaign. We have a workshop for us, astrophotography with your smartphone and a very nice um, seminar on the cultural relevance of dark sky protection. We are launching it very soon. So please keep your eyes open. Okay. I'm very excited about that. Uh, so now we invite John back and John, I ask it to you <laughs> and again the seminar and again, um, post pandemic practice is gone. Um, so John, we're gonna talk about the New Zealand Dark and Sky Network. I will stop sharing if you wanna share your screen again, John.
Yeah. We see your screen good. Okay. Is that working? Try to pass it, pass one slide forward. Let's see. So, so this talk is I'm getting, getting a lot of feedback. Yes. So this talk is about um, dark sky protection in New Zealand. And I want to start by mentioning that uh, in 2019, we had a conference on dark sky protection called the Starlight Conference. It says uh, you are screen sharing on Zoom. So I stop share. So what shall I do? Stop sharing. Screen share. So we had a conference in New Zealand called the Starlight Conference, and it was on um, light pollution in general. Um, we discussed the technology of light emitting diodes, uh, which are commonly used for street lights. We talked about astronomy and stargazing and astrotourism, the environmental impacts of light pollution, the health impacts of light pollution, and even the aesthetic beauty of the dark night sky. So it embraced all these topics. And I know Junichi San was uh, present. So uh, I think it was a We had a lot of fun. And um, about 120 people came and about 30 from other countries. So New Zealand is quite dark because it's the same area as Japan, but we have 5 million people. Japan has a 125 million, I think. So the population density is much less. Here is the map of sky brightness in New Zealand. The largest city here is Auckland with 1.5 million. The North Island has a about 4 million people, the South Island about 1 million, and I live here in Christchurch, which has some light pollution, as you can see, but in the middle of the South Island, it is very dark. I will show you this map um, a little bit later. So astronomers first started worrying about light pollution as in the 1970s, and the IAU published a report about the effect of light pollution on astronomical observatories in 1980 by Roger Carel and others. And this was IAU CIE report number one. And it shows that light from a city, even if the city is invisible from the observatory, light can be scattered into the path of view of a telescope and therefore photons from the city can enter a telescope even though the city is hidden by a hill. So to protect um, observatories or the night sky from light pollution, it's very important that street lights are shining down and not up. So a full cutoff luminaire would look like that. And this is what we want to avoid. And of course, this light is putting light upwards, which is completely wasted uh, light generation. So um, astronomers prefer this kind of lighting, full cutoff, and want to avoid this. Here is the night sky you would see 
in these different situations. And by the way, uh, objects are much more visible without glare, which is light shining directly into our eyes. You, <coughs> you can see um, this person much more clearly uh, with no glare than this person under this light. And light pollution also has uh, the consequence that light shining up is, of course, wasted, but light shining into windows is called light trespass, and that has to be avoided, especially if people are trying to sleep. So this situation of light trespass disturbing people's sleep at night is what we should avoid by having properly installed lighting that illuminates a scene on the ground like that. Another thing to avoid is glare, which is light shining directly into our eyes instead of illuminating a scene. And here is an example of glare, which actually reduces the visibility of objects uh, near the light because um, light is scattering inside our eyes and um, reducing the contrast. So here is the same scene, one with a lot of light pollution, uh, no stars visible, but if the light is not um, shining directly into our eyes, then we can see plenty of stars. And here is the familiar constellation of Orion, uh, on the left in a dark sky uh, sight, where you see many stars on the right in a, a light polluted city where only the uh, brightest stars are visible. So I think in the last uh, 20 years roughly, uh, since about 2000, uh, the emphasis to combat light pollution uh, has shifted away from mainly astronomers. Before, uh, in the past, it was entirely astronomers in 1970s and 80s. But now, uh, people are saying that light pollution um, is bad because uh, it hinders astrotourism. It's bad for the environment. It's bad for human health. And if we have uh, lights shining down, we uh, can save money by uh, having less light. So it's shining onto scenes where the light is really needed. So astronomers are still uh, anxious to combat light pollution. But I think now there is a louder voice from environmentalists, from the health community, and from those doing astrotourism. And when you tell local governments that they're wasting money with putting light in the sky, and they can save money, they are probably also enthusiastic about better lighting. Here is an example of better lighting. This is in Auckland, New Zealand, at the port, where lights uh, used to shine in all directions, and there are many floodlights, so the ships can load and unload at night. But a few years ago, they changed that lighting. Now it looks like this. And you can see that the lights are shining down. There are fewer of them. And you can even see the moon. I think it's the moon or it may be. A, I, think, I think you can see the moon. Well, here is a famous uh, map. Um, based on satellite observations. It's the uh, Global Atlas of Light Pollution produced by Fabio Falchi in Italy. And you, you can see which parts of the world are most affected by light pollution. Much of North America, especially the Eastern side, much of Europe, especially Western Europe, Japan, is very clearly visible, South Korea, but the Southern Hemisphere is much less affected. You can just see New Zealand there, I think, and the, a few cities in Australia. Um, but one of the darkest countries in the world is actually North Korea, which is here. 
which you cannot see at all. So North Korea is an absolute paradise for astronomers, but there aren't many uh, astronomers there. I want to say a few words about our observatory at Mount John. It was founded in 1965 by the universities of Canterbury in New Zealand and Pennsylvania in the US. The Americans uh, stayed in partnership for 10 years until about 1975. And um, it's in the middle of the South Island. There are four telescopes there, four small telescopes. The largest is a 1.8 meter for micro lensing to discover exoplanets. It's a joint project between Canterbury and Nagoya University in Japan. This is a one meter telescope, which we built uh, at the university and two small 60 centimeter telescopes. <clears throat> so the observatory is of Mount John is in the middle of the South Island where the skies are very dark on the shores of Lake Tekapo, about 44 degrees southern latitude. It's the world's southernmost observatory except for telescopes in Antarctica. And there is a picture of the South Island of New Zealand from space. This is Lake Tekapo, 25 kilometers in length, and the observatory is there. So here is a picture of the one meter telescope. You can see it's a very dry um, highland plateau in the middle of the South Island with very few trees. And there's the 1.8 meter telescope dome and the Milky Way, um, a nice clear night. The telescope is closed, so you might wonder why. That's because this was before the telescope was commissioned. It was still under being installed in 2004. So in 2004, we actually started uh, astrotourism between two people uh, started at Graham Murray and a Japanese person, Hideazawa, who may be listening now, I'm not sure. And, but in 2012, <coughs> we applied to the International Dark Sky Association to have a dark sky reserve, the Aoraki Mackenzie International Dark Sky Reserve. And that was the first reserve to be recognized in the Southern Hemisphere. And it was promoting astrotourism in uh, around our observatory. So this is the area of the reserve, 4367 square kilometers, very large. It's about 60 kilometers east to west and 100 kilometers north to south. Two big lakes, Lake Tekapo, and the observatory is here, and Lake Pukaki. There are just three small villages, uh, Lake Tekapo Village, Twizel, and Mount Cook Village in the north. So the total population of Twizel is about hmm, 1,000, Tekapo 300, and Mount Cook Village probably one or 200. In Tekapo village, we have very dark sky friendly lighting. The street lights are these bollards about one meter high. The first type of lighting used uh, low pressure sodium bollards like that, which is perfectly adequate for pedestrians and cars driving on these streets. The new type of uh, lighting is an LED, uh, in the top of this cone and the LED light source you can see there. So these are amber LEDs, which are now used in Tekapo village and Twizel. Now Mount John is here on the shores of Lake Tekapo and the village is about two kilometers away uh, in a direct line. So, protecting the lights in the village, uh, protecting the observatory from lights in the village uh, with a distance of two kilometers is important. And this is the view of the village from Mount John, uh, taken at a time with low pressure sodium lights, 
Now they are 2,200 Kelvin LEDs. So this photo is a little bit out of date. There is some light pollution, but it's very little. I want to show you a video taken from uh, near Mount John. This is Mount John Observatory on top there. There is the village looking south. So this is one complete night from Mount John. You can see that there is a little light pollution, but the stars are nevertheless very visible. And this is a complete winter's night and takes about two minutes. Astronomers are going up and down the, to the observatory. I don't know why, but perhaps they were late to get to the telescope. And now the sun is rising. So that's one night at Mount John. Astrotourism has been important at the observatory as well as astronomical research. And here is a company called Earth and Sky uh, in 2007, having a tour of the uh, night sky using this small telescope. And that's a fifth telescope belonging to uh, the astrotourism company. So they go up to the observatory in buses and look at the Milky Way and the stars. And there's another view uh, from Tekapo village. This is a small church on the lake shore. And you can see the Southern Cross, the pointers, the cul sac, and the Milky Way. So astrotourism has been very important for, Mount, uh, for uh, Mackenzie District uh, and Lake Tekapo village. Um, about 1 million people were spending a night in the village uh, every year uh, by the 2019. Of course, the pandemic um, made that drop, but a steady increase, uh, largely caused by astro tourists. About 150,000 astro tourists were coming every year. So it was a very popular. The Darts, International Dark Sky Reserve was created in 2012, and the tourists were spending about um, 120 million New Zealand dollars. That's about 80 million US dollars. Uh, a New Zealand dollar is about 87 yen. So they were spending 120 million uh, New Zealand dollars, uh, 29, 10, 11, 12. When the reserve was created, then there was a sudden increase in how much visitors were spending and it was almost $1 million per day in 2018. Or well, by 2019, it was $1 million per day. Of course, uh, the pandemic stopped that, but now it's increasing again. It's probably up to about here. Once again, tourists are coming back. In New Zealand, uh, the Araki Mackenzie International Dark Sky Reserve, created in 2012, was the first. But we now have five dark sky places. Uh, Great Barrier Island near Auckland in 2017. Stewart Island, which is a, an island south of the South Island of New Zealand in 2019. A dark sky park in the north of the South Island in 2020. And the most recent, the Wairapa International Dark Sky Reserve founded in January this year in the southern North Island. So this is a map uh, showing the dark sky places in these blue stars, Great Barrier Island, uh, Waiiti, Auraki Mackenzie, and Stewart Island. And now also the Waira Rapper is here. That is the one created this year, it should be blue. But many other places, are wanting to become dark sky places with IDA accreditation. In fact, about 24 places in total in New Zealand are interested in uh, applying to IDA. Most in the South Island where the skies are darker, only 1 million people live here, and a few also in the North Island where 4 million people live. So the Ones which uh, should become dark sky places next are Kaikoura, Naseby, 
in the South Island, Waiheke Island near Auckland, and Kua'otunu Peninsula, which is also in the North Island. So I went, uh, spent too much time, some are in the early stages of applying, talking to IDA, and some are just uh, thinking about it, but not doing anything yet. So let's not worry about the complete list, but there are many communities in New Zealand who want to become dark sky places with IAU accreditation, uh, mainly to support astrotourism. So after the Starlight Conference, we've formed a dark sky network. And what is the dark sky network aspires to, for New Zealand to be a dark sky nation. IDA, the International Dark Sky Association, has never defined this term, but I think it can mean anything we want. And if we have 12 or even 20 dark sky places in New Zealand, this would be more than most countries. And I think we can say we are a dark sky nation. We will define it when we have a large number of communities with IDA accreditation. So just coming back to uh, light pollution, perhaps I should have shown this slide earlier. Most lights in most places are now light emitting diodes. The first ones were 4,000 Kelvin with a big blue peak caused by gallium nitride in the solid states emitters, but warmer LEDs with phosphor converted uh, amber LEDs absorb the blue and put it out into the uh, visual region. So these are now warm white. At Aoraki Mackenzie Dark Sky Reserve, we have 2,200 Kelvin LEDs, where the blue peak is less than 10% of the light, maybe about 3%. So the color temperature of LEDs uh, is very different. There's a 5,000 Kelvin LED 2,700 in Lake Tekapo village in Twizel, we're using 2,200. So even more orange than that. So just to finish, um, I made a petition to the New Zealand Parliament in uh, uh, January this year. So anyone can uh, make a petition, any New Zealander can petition the House of Representatives. So I said, instead of light pollution being controlled by local government, the district councils or city councils, we should have a national law controlling light pollution because uh, light pollution technology is quite complicated. And we spend a lot of time in the dark sky network explaining to local government what kind of lights they should install. If we had a national law like France and Croatia, and I think Slovenia also has national law, then it would be much simpler for New Zealand to become a dark sky nation. So the petition to parliament has proposed this. Anyone can sign this petition. The reason for the petition is this, light pollution from artificial light at night can harm human health by disrupting circadian rhythm and the production of hormones such as uh, melatonin. Artificial light at night has an adverse effect on many species of flora, fauna and flora, some being driven to extinction by 24 seven illumination. Excess artificial light at night wastes electricity, so has an adverse economic impact. Reducing artificial light at night can promote dark skies and astrotourism, especially at Matariki. Matariki are the Pleiades or Subaru, and it's a Matariki is a national holiday in New Zealand. So everyone is looking at the stars. So that's in June or July every year. Uh, we have a national holiday, and less light can make streets safer by reducing glare. So there are many positive region, reasons for having a national law. So anyone, including 
anyone in the world, not just New Zealanders, can support my petition by going to the New Zealand Parliamentary Petitions website before the 20th of April. If you go to that website, um, well, the complete website has all this code, but if you go to this website and then search for my name, Hernshaw, then you will find my petition. Just add your name and signature, and this will support the petition and make the members of parliament, our politicians, take notice. Thank you very much for your attention. Working group to ask their questions. John, I would just ask you to sign out of- uh, Sharing? Stop, just stop, just sign out of Zoom. As we plan, we use one computer, much more easier without all these sound issues as we had planned. Um, so Christine from YouTube ask, how does she join the face group? The face group, sorry, the YouTube the working group channel. We receive a question from Christine on YouTube asking how to join the Facebook, the working group. She should um, email Aniket Suli in Mumbai and Aniket's email address, I will just check is... I don't think you should say Aniket's email in, on, on YouTube, John. We will uh, contact the email address is, is confidential, is that right? No, but we haven't asked <laughs> if we can. Well, how do I respond? Aniket will add anyone who wants to be a working group member at large to the base camp. So how do they do that? Can you tell me? Yes. Um, so Christine, we will send you a private message with uh, the information from Aniket, or if you go to the IU website with the information on the working group, you have information there. I added the link on your comments. Sorry, you. John, do you not be disclosing? <laughs> Anyone here has some questions for John? Uh, very short question. Envoy will be uh, is more expensive than a usual white one or postage equal. I, I didn't understand. Uh, uh, I, I want to know the uh, cost for Envoy. Really. The cost? cost yes. Or, the, yeah. I think the PC amber LEDs may be a little more expensive than the very harsh white uh, 4000 Kelvin LEDs, but not much more. And I can't quote any figures, but I would guess about 10% more. And the McKenzie district council, local government, were very happy to order 2,200 Kelvin. Um, in New Zealand, there was a special government grant which uh, paid 85% of the cost mm -hmm. of LEDs, and they agreed to, uh, in Mackenzie district, because it's very important, astro-tourism place, uh, and Ast astronomy research, they agreed to uh, pay for 2,200 Kelvin, which cost a bit more, but not much more. Thank you. <laughs> and anyone Kelly. from Zoom? Oh, sorry, Kelly. No, please go ahead. Um, um, and I was wondering, um, I know at least for one of them, that became a really like, large source of income for that community. Um, so how did you work with those communities and collaborate and consult with them in order to establish the Dark Sky Reserve? Um, was there any pushback that you got from the community? Very little. Um, I know that in the McKenzie district, there are some farmers who like to make hay 
at night under floodlights. And occasionally we see uh, farmers working at night and they weren't very keen on a lighting ordinance, which we, by the way, we've had a lighting ordinance for local laws controlling light pollution in the Mackenzie since 1981. It was, I think, the first lighting ordinance in the Southern Hemisphere. And it was based on the lighting ordinance of Tucson, Arizona. So there was very little pushback. The um, Mackenzie District Council were very keen to promote astrotourism because of the good economic impact. So in the Mackenzie District, there are 4,500 inhabitants. So there are very few people living there. And those people have to pay rates, which is kind of local tax. So there's very little money going into that council from the rate payers, because there are so few of them. But the tourism has become very important. And because of that, the local politicians have been very supportive of astrotourism. In Tekapo Village, there are nine companies doing astrotourism. The largest one was called Earth and Sky, which I mentioned, now changed its name to Dark Sky Project. And they employ um, about 100 people. And um, they have about 30 or 40 night sky guides. So that's a very big company. And they have thousands of people uh, every year doing night sky tours. So, yeah, the economy of Mackenzie District really relies on astrotourism. And um, it's brought thousands of people. And of course, if you're going on a night sky tour, you really have to stay overnight in uh, in the village. So there are many uh, accommodation providers, motels or homestays in Tekapo village. So the, yeah, the politicians have really supported them. They say they love the Araki Mackenzie Dark Sky Reserve because it brings more money to the district than anything else. It's actually been a problem of having too many tourists. Mm -hmm. And that's why we are so keen to support other places in New Zealand to get into astrotourism. Tekapa has been too crowded, especially with Chinese, Koreans, and Japanese. I'm <laughs> 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 Anyone on Zoom would like to ask a question or add to the conversation about the working group or the dark skies protection? All right. Thank you. Of course. Yeah. Um, I, I'm very interested to see the improvement of the writing on the foreground board. Uh, yes. So, uh, how did you realize that? Well, I was not involved uh -huh. at all. So obviously people in Auckland uh, uh -huh. lobbied for that. Uh -huh. There is a public observatory uh, run by the Auckland Astronomical Society. Uh -huh. And I suspect they uh, negotiated this. But when you think that um, it saves electricity, mm -hmm. probably the port uh, was very happy to agree. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us on Zoom and here at NEOJ. So sorry about the technical issues in the beginning. And see you next time. <laughs>